Uh, good morning to everyone, and again, I'd like to thank uh, Slovodom and Keon for asking me to present some early uh, data that we've been gathering as far as the couplers typical placement. Um, despite my name, I know absolutely no German at all. Uh, very little. I learned a few words last night, and I've already forgotten them, so I don't. Um, d just to go over the traditional total hip replacement, we've just gone over that, but just to go over quickly, um, it is a double shell, the fossa inlay. Um, the new heads are now ceramic, uh, and again, that's to decrease or try to decrease the amount of wear products that are produced in the total hip. And the stem dimensions, again, allow that you have a complete modular system where you can pick the appropriate size as a tabular component, head and neck, just to custom fit each patient. Um, the role of the, the fossa itself is to help decrease the amount of wear products. I know we've gone from polyethylene inlay to peak inlay, but again, some wear products are produced no matter what uh, component or materials the acetabular portion or component is made out of. And it does help distribute distress over the bone, and what this does is it helps incorporation of the acetabular component into the acetabular bone itself. And again, with the newer system, with the hydroxyapatite coating, it does increase, again, the bone integration and possibly decrease the amount of loosening that we do see with the acetabular component. When you look at all the, the clinical information that's available with the Zurich, his, um, the Zurich cementless system, a lot of it was done early on by um, Bontevon, and then Aldo has done quite a lot and published quite a lot on the system, and there's some other publications out there. And again, this is good information to look at the decrease in the amount of complication that's occurred over the year with the improvement of the system itself. The overall complication, if you look at all the available um, manuscripts and data, is about 10%. And that varies from as low as 5% to as high as 20%. But the good news is that you can resolve the majority of these, you know, half to 90%. At least you can go and revise these in salvage to hip itself with a complete failure rate, meaning that you have to explant the case in about 1% to 5%. <clears throat> Some of the, the technical um, aspects, again, the the acetabular component has always been a weak link to the total hip system. First, there were the polyethylene wear products, and we've all experienced that, where there is wear. Um, these dogs take much more steps, and they stress the implant a lot more than humans do. The metal on metal has always turned out to be a disaster, a lot of wear products generated from that. Ceramic and ceramic, if you go to YouTube and you type this in, you'll see people that have videotaped their hips and the squeaky noise that they have with every step that they take. Um, they've tried to improve the polyethylene with cross links and vitamin E, um, and it's helped some, but the vitamin E coating has weakened the overall material strength of the polyethylene. And then PEAK is the newest material that's being used with a carbon ring inlay to, again, help decrease the amount of wear products that's produced. So. When you look at the human side of things, it takes about 20 cases or so for someone to become proficient in putting in the femur, while it takes around 200 cases to become proficient at putting in the acetabular, acetabular component, which is always the difficult part of the total hip. And when you look at the average number of cases that a human surgeon is putting in a year, it's roughly around 10 per year. So what are the consequences of only doing 10 surgeries per year is you don't really have any confidence and if you don't have confidence you're certainly not going to be recruiting those cases and with no cases you're not going to gain the confidence in order to do them and this is exactly what Antonio was referring to was that sometimes you do need to refer these to someone that has more experience with that experience you do learn how to handle certain situations in more difficult cases so when you look at conservative versus management, we do know that pain management does fail in the majority of cases. We see this in dogs and it's seen in humans as well. Non-steroidals, even the uh, immunotherapies that they're using, it does fail. 
and after somebody is 70 years of age and they've had all these problems, that they finally do a total hip, and then after the total hip, you know, we do have complications, so are they better off, yes or no? In the successful cases, they certainly are better. So, you know, how can pain management ever be for dogs? How do we really know? There's some recent studies saying that it doesn't really help that much when it comes to pain management in dogs with osteoarthritis. So we're stuck in this situation where, you know, surgical intervention will help these dogs quite a bit. So why do we operate the hips? So well, it's obvious because they're painful. And, you know, there are one million hips done worldwide, roughly. And do we improve the quality of life? Yes, in those cases that are successful, the people are very happy and, you know, they're very thrilled that they've had a total hip. So the question is always, why are they painful to start with? We do know that it's, it's osteoarthritis. And this is work that Slobodan did during his PhD at uh, MIT where they looked at cadaveric uh, hips that were placed in saline baths at normal body temperature, and they put thermoresistors on the acetabular component or in the acetabulum to measure the heat that's generated in the cartilage. And this graph is pretty small, but what they showed is that it does increase, you know, greater than about two degrees Celsius, and later, Pritchett actually did a study in which he measured the temperatures in vivo in humans that have had total hips or resurfacing done so that they could actually measure what is the temperature gradient in these people after about an hour of walking. And what they found that in normal hips, the temperature goes up about two degrees Celsius. In an arthritic hip, it's about four degrees. Um, hemi-metals and hemi-ceramic, again, around 5 to 4 degrees Celsius, and then resurfacing metal was the worst at about 10 degrees. So, you know, the question's always been, this is in synovial fluid, what happens in bone? So, in essence, what's happening is that the temperature is going up so high that we're actually having death of the chondrocytes in the articular cartilage. So, the question with the coupless is can, um, and it's the amorphous diamond-like carbon coating with a aspherical femoral head, can that come close to mimicking cartilage on cartilage as far as temperature goes? So the hip system or the coupless hip system, what it is, it's an aspherical femoral head which is flattened and the reason it's flattened is to reduce the contact stress and to improve the lubrication of the joint. Um, again, the diamond-like carbon coating can it mimic the cartilage to cartilage contact that's in a normal joint? And we do know that when you look at the human side for finger replacement and small joint replacement, that the pyrolytic carbon that they use on bone is a lot less, it's 400 times less than that of ceramic on bone. And this is a picture of the coupless, which you can see here with the aspherical head. When you look at it closely, you can't see that. Again, it's a modular system where we have different lengths of decks, different size heads. Um, now the stems, again, they're all hydroxyapatite coated. Um, one thing is you'll notice this small dot or indent that's located on the head, and that is so that when you position it in the animal, that is to be pointed towards the greater trochanter which will position the um, aspherical head correctly in the acetabulum. And again, here with this view, you can see the aspherical heads. Again, they're available in all the different sizes so that we, you can use them in one fashion. You can use them if you're doing a total hip and for some reason the acetabular component fails or it will not uh, properly seat, you can convert over to a coupless system. And again, this is showing the, the implant itself. This is the small dot that's supposed to go towards the greater trochanter. And again, that aligns the head to properly fit in the acetabulum. One thing that you'll notice is the reamers are different. They are more spherical in nature and not, um, they don't have a distinct equator. So they're gonna ream just a little bit different. And again, we'll go over the different size reamers but this is a 24 to a 28. So again, it's compatible 
with the total hip system as far as the acetabular reamers go. And then again, even for the mini size, there's a size 18 and a size 20 that's also uh, can be used. So just to show you, this is in this model. You can see we're gonna ream, and you're just gonna ream down a little bit past the cancellous bone. So we ream just a little bit deeper in this system. And the other thing that you'll notice is for the neck, and here we have it implanted in a neutral position, with the bigger head that's located in the acetabulum, the rate of impingement goes down. And with impingement going down, theoretically we should have a decreased amount of luxation that occurs in the postoperative period. And that's in a neutral position when we have the limb extended and then flexed. Again, the amount that you need to flex and extend the femur before you get impingement is even a lot greater than what most animals will normally undergo. And even with abduction of the limb, impingement is decreased quite a bit. So what are the, the sizes? Again, the standard size cupless is very compatible with the current cementless system. The stems come in extra small, small, medium, and large. And the necks are short, medium, long, and extra long. And one thing that you'll notice is that since there's not an acetabular component, the neck size tends to be just a little bit longer. So if you were to use a medium, you may be using a long neck, but again, the overall comparable length of the head to the stem is still the same. It's just that we don't have the acetabular component. And again, the head comes in 22 all the way to 32 millimeters, which again corresponds to the uh, total hip system currently available. So you can do any combination thereof, and it's a modular system. You can do it with the mini, cupless as well, so those sizes are 18 and 20. Again, the smaller the implant, there is an increased rate of complications, especially with luxations. And again, with the mini, any sizes um, available, and again, the heads are size 18 to 20. So what are the potential benefits to doing the cupless? One is, when you look at the complication rates, the majority of complication rates with total hips is directly correlated with the acetabular component or the acetabular portion and luxation as well. There's a lower cost. The greatest cost to the system right now is the cup itself, so removing that will decrease the cost about 40%. A shorter learning curve, because again, doing the femur is probably the easier of the two steps in preparing the femur. It, yes, it takes time, but it's much easier than dealing with um, the acetabulum. We can reduce surgery time, and reducing surgery time is beneficial for the patient and also decreases the chances of postoperative infections from occurring. And then, in essence, what we've done is eliminate the wear products. And again, Peak with ceramic does have very low wear products, but again, putting these in a very young animal, less than a year at around a year of age, are we still gonna have problems just further on down the road with wear products? So to go over just a few cases of the cupless, roughly we're up to about 20 cases that we've done, and this is just to present certain situations that we've done um, the cupless hip system in. This, is, this first case is a four-year-old female mixed breed dog um, that presented for bilateral hip dysplasia, and we ended up using a small stem, extra short head and neck, which again, there are some downfalls of using an extra short head and neck, and then a 23.5 millimeter acetabular component. And this is, again, during the, um, while well, we were using the polyethylene cup, so they weren't the peak cup, so this is an earlier generation model. And this is six years postoperatively, the owner reported that the dog was becoming lame, not weight-bearing. So when we look at the radiographs, we can see the lucency and the shifting of the cup. It's retroverted, so it's loose. And then we have this reaction medially to the acetabulum. Um, this owner, it's, it's good and bad, a very understanding owner, but he was a human orthopedic surgeon himself, so that poses its own problems. So the first thing we did is we ruled out an infection. We did ultrasound-guided arthrocentesis, submitted that, 
for culture, did cytology, didn't see any bacteria. But again, when we did the arthrocentesis, we did get a very cloudy um, joint fluid. You can see some discoloration, and they did notice some sort of metallic uh, product when we did the cytology. So we spoke to the owner about what to do. This is a close-up, and here again, you can see the shifting of the cup. Um, you can see this medial uh, bone reaction that's occurring. Uh, the radiologist wasn't really concerned for an infectious process. There was a bone reaction, but maybe more going with a aseptic loosening than a septic loosening. So we discussed three options with the owner. One was to just go in, replace the cup with maybe a bigger size cup. This was a 23.5 millimeter cup to start with, and when we used a template, it was going to be difficult to go to a 26. Uh, 26 would have been, I think, a little bit too big and removed more of the caudal pillar, which made it difficult, maybe durable, but difficult at the time. We talked about the possibility of using a revision cup to remove it, then used a revision cup, and then lastly was to do a cupless. Um, given the dog's age and um, the owner decided to go with a cupless total hip, and this is immediately post-operative. We went in, we took cultures and biopsies, but we used a 24 millimeter cupless. We left the stem alone at this point, and this is again immediately following surgery. This is two years follow-up on this case, and you can start seeing, uh, we've seen these in the cases where they start developing a sclerotic ring on the acetabulum. Again, the medial cortex is still smooth, although, yes, there is a bone reaction there, but we um, attributed that to the previous loosening. And this is the dog. Again, this is two years follow-up, and this is just showing the dog. Again, we didn't do anything to the other side. There is a, a lameness there. It's definitely a grade one lameness. But again, given the how the dog came in originally, and these are just two more videos of that same case, um, you know, we consider this a very good outcome, and the owner considered this a very good outcome, and the dog is still doing well today. Um, yes, there's a lameness, but again, for a revision and using the coupless, you know, this was a, a way out so that we could at least not remove the explant or not explant the case and just leave it as an FHO. Um, the other cases is for a primary hip replacement, again, for financial reasons. And this is a five-year-old male neutered mixed breed dog that came in for bilateral hip dysplasia. Initially, this was the very first one that we ever did. Uh, and this is a very small dog. You see videos in just a second. We used a mini, um, a large mini stem on this dog. And originally, I put an 18 millimeter coupless head. Um, this dog did fantastic after surgery, and then 10 days later, it luxated. So brought the dog back in surgery. Um, and what we did is a deep gluteal tenodesis. And we did further remount the cup and put a 20 millimeter cup and a 20-millimeter uh, coupless head. Again, I think this was more technical and not really the, the function of the coupless itself. And the reason for the cerclage wire, um, that was because of just given the size of the femoral component compared to the femur, we did a lot of reaming, and I did that just to try to prevent a fracture from occurring. Some people would plate that as well, but just given the additional cost of the plating, I just put a single AO loop cerclage. Now, this is the dog within 24 hours of the revision. Um, and this dog, yes, it, you'll see it's um, barely toe-touching lame. Uh, we'll just, for the sake of time, just go through this a little bit more, but I think you can get the gist that this dog is fairly lame at this point. But again, it had a revision done. How much of the, was it a revision? How much of it was the coupless? We did enroll this dog in physical therapy, and this is three weeks after the revision. Again, the dog is much improved, not perfect, but again, doing fairly well given everything that it went through. And this dog ended up doing very well. This owner is an avid hiker and 
a year after this, this dog hiked the entire Appalachian Trail, which is again around 2,000 miles, which is, you know, again, consider that a very good outcome for this case. And following up with this owner, he's still happy and everything is going well. And we have about, on this dog, about three years or so follow up on it. And this dog continues to do well. Um, this is a, another case. This is a nine month old uh, male intact Marima. We have this happen a lot. Um, this is unfortunate, but a lot of dogs where I live get hit by trains. There's a lot of cold trains and they wander the tracks and they get hit by trains. And this dog, again, had a capital physial fracture and it had a caudalacid tabular fracture. This went to several specialists and the owners were, uh, didn't have a lot of money, didn't know what to do. They had been talked about just fixing the, um, the capital physial fracture, seeing how the dog does, and then later on, if it needs a total hip, to do a total hip at that time, to do an FHO, or lastly, to do a hip replacement. Um, they couldn't afford a hip replacement. Um, I'm sure this happens in Europe as it does in the US, but everyone gets on Dr. Google, so she got on Dr. Google, looked up everything, and Dr. Google suggested that FHO probably isn't the best thing. There are complications with uh, repair of a capital physial fracture, so the owners did opt for some sort of total hip, but they couldn't afford a total hip. So in this case, we ended up doing a coupless, and here you can see immediately postoperatively, we didn't do anything for the contralateral hip that had the caudal acetabular fracture. She was okay with waiting on that just to see what would happen. And this is six months down the road. Uh, we do have the beginning of a sclerotic ring forming around the, the head. And this is the dog. This is six weeks following surgery. This, it is amazing because we didn't do anything to the other side. And this dog, again, did quite well given everything. But again, um, some lameness associated with the coupless, but again, this dog went on to do very well and is still doing good. Um, it's doing very well on the contralateral hip as well with the caudal acetabular fracture and continues to do well, um, which again, that's a little unpredictable if anything's gonna be needed to be done in the future with this case. Um, this is another case to go over quickly, and this was Rocky, a, a young English pointer. Uh, and this dog was used as a working dog. Um, the left side was worse than the right, and the owner definitely wanted to see if a total hip would help this dog so that it can get around, do well, and not have to do anything with the contralateral hip. Uh, this owner was talked to quite a bit about complications of just leaving the other side alone as hard as he wanted to work the dog. Uh, we did template this dog, and on the left side, we did a total hip on this dog. And those three pins, I just do a small osteotomy of the insertion of the deep gluteal, um, and that's just how we repair it with just three pins holding it in place. But again, this dog did well with the total hip for about a year, and then the owner wanted something done with the other side, but he couldn't afford a total hip. Um, so again, he was stuck in doing an FHO. We tried physical therapy, we tried um, non-steroidals, and we tried some immunotherapy as well. His veterinarian tried stem cell therapy. None of that really seemed to work, but he did not want a total hip. So we did talk to him about doing a coupless, and this is immediately after surgery. We can see the coupless hip in place. Um, this dog did need um, a lot. We started this dog pretty aggressively on physical therapy, and this is about three, four weeks following surgery. So we started physical therapy on this case, and this dog actually did very well. Did go on to go back to hunting, using his leg well. When you look at this dog walk, and I wish I had a video of this, he is still probably maybe a grade one lameness on the coupless side, and is, you know, again, you can hardly tell anything happened on the total hip side, which you can predict. But again, the owner reports that the dog doesn't, you know, hunts all day, does very well. Um, we do a pretty aggressive rehab on these cases and all the coupless cases, which seems to help 
fairly well. Um, the last case to go over quickly, um, this is Chloe, a two-year-old female spade golden retriever who had right-sided hip luxations. We did do a pen hip on this just to make, to evaluate the left hip and it scored well, the right side failed. This owner is a referring veterinarian, but the thing about this is he has two other golden retrievers and over the years on these golden retrievers, um, each dog has bilateral total hips already and bilateral TPLO procedures. So in two dogs, when you added it up, he was already at like $32,000 worth of two dogs. So I said, maybe you shouldn't buy it from that breeder anymore, but he, was, he loved the temperament of the dog. He goes, I don't care, I just like the temperament. So you have to stay in business somehow. So this, he could not afford another total hip. He goes, I just can't do it. I don't want an FHO either. I know enough about those. So this is another case that we did a coupless total hip. Although you can't really template for the head itself, what I do is I just pretend that I'm gonna put in a total hip so that you can get the dimensions of the, of the reaming so that you know about what size to ream with. And this is the dog right before suture removal. And again, the, you have to, you know, this exemplifies a lot of frustration that I'm sure you go through with the short leash walks, nothing on slippery floors, so forth and so on. And this is a referring veterinarian, so um, he's not following the rules either. And those are the other two dogs in the background as well that's had everything done. This is the dog around three weeks, and this is the dog at five weeks postoperatively. And again, there is, a, there is a lameness, but when you examine these dogs and you do range of motion, they're not painful, they don't react. I don't know what exactly that is. Um, the earlier dogs that we did have improved over time, so I don't know if that's part of the acetabulum becoming, and you have to like the dog jumping on the couch or the chair, um, but is it, we have to wait until more of the bone becomes sclerotic? Is, that's what occurring, but these dogs are doing well. The owners are reporting that uh, the outcomes are very satisfactory to them, and they're happy, which, which helps the situation as well. So in conclusion, early on, is this an alternative to a total hip? Yes, it can be if used correctly. Uh, it can be a very good way to salvage a total hip if you cannot do a revision cup or there's nothing that you really can do as far as um, getting the acetabular component to actually stay if you've over-reamed or reamed incorrectly. If you've completely reamed incorrectly, meaning too dorsal, there's nothing that you can do. A coupless isn't gonna save you from every situation. A decreased learning curve, because again, the main thing that you have to become proficient in is reaming the femur. We do decrease the complications associated with the acetabular component or the cuff, which is always the weak link to the hip system. Do we decrease fluxations? That's hard to tell. I don't think we have enough cases to really say that, but that is a potential uh, positive of using the cuffless. And we do have a clinical trial. And in talking to Slovodom, I know that there's about 50 of these that have been implanted. Uh, it'd be nice to gather up that information if you go to the key on website, you can enter that information on there. But so far, it's been very positive, and um, hopefully soon, or in a couple years, we can gather this information and present it again. Thank you.